Thanks, Betsy. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Vic Fleischer. I'm the University Archivist and Head of Archival Services at the University of Akron. I'll be the moderator for the 1230 session, which is titled Making It Workflow, New Employees in an Era of Change. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the panelists for this session, which are Brenna Edwards, Kay Lewandowska, Stephanie Luke, and Catherine Slover. Uh, Brenna Edwards is currently manager for digital archives at the Harry Ransom Center at the University of Texas at Austin. Previously, she was project digital archivist at the Stuart A. Rose Manuscript Archives and Rare Book Library at Emory University. She has a BA from Tennessee Tech University and an MSLS from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Carolina K. Lewandowska has served as records manager at Commander Navy Installations Command since the day uh, they were they sent everybody home to work. Uh, while at home, she has been able to establish rapport with members of diverse groups, create over 50 fact sheets, latest topics and resources, and provide countless training uh, sessions via Teams. She has experience in archives in both the federal and private sector with digital asset management, metadata creation, taxonomy, implementation, uh, digitization, processing, and training development. <clears throat> Stephanie Luke is the metadata librarian for special collections at the University of Texas at Arlington Libraries. She has a master's degree in English literature and a master's of library science with specialization in rare books and manuscripts. And finally, Catherine Sto uh, Slover is digital archivist at the University of Texas at Arlington Special Collections, which she joined in August 2020. Prior to joining UTA, she worked as the electronic processing archivist at the South Carolina Department of Archives and History, and as archives assistant at the Rutherford, or Rutherford County Archives. Catherine holds an MA in public history with a focus in archival management from Middle, Middle Tennessee State University. Uh, so we have four panelists in only about an hour, but we should have time at the end uh, of the session for questions. Please use the Q&A feature uh, to post your questions, and then I will uh, read those at the end of the session. Uh, so without further ado, I'll turn it over to our panelists. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, think can y'all see the um someone can give me a thumbs up or come on and confirm i see that, it okay i'm sharing the right one um <laughs> so hi everyone um i'm katherine slover um today my colleagues and i are going to discuss workflows and documentation with you um we are let me go to the next slide uh, we're going to start off introducing the topic, discussing the importance of um, workflows and documentation, defining some terms, and then we'll each speak on our individual experiences with documentation and workflows during the pandemic specifically. And then finally, we're going to give you all some tools and tips to help create efficient workflows and documentation in your own institutions. And then there should be time for um, a Q&A after that. So before we jump in, one thing we're gonna be bringing up throughout the presentation is to never make assumptions um, and never assume that anybody um, has the same knowledge as you do on a specific topic. And this is really important when creating documentation and workflows. And so with that in mind, we wanted to start the presentation with a few definitions, just so we're all on the same page. And as we go through this presentation, um, like I said, we all, we all have the same definitions of, of uh, the terms we're talking about. So we define workflows as a series of activities needed to complete a task from start to finish. Um, and we're discussing step-by-step -step instructions for um, standard ritualistic tasks. In this presentation, um, documentation can refer to how-to guides, documents tracking work output, reports for completed projects, and policy documentation. And lastly, onboarding is the process of introducing new hires to the office environment. You may know many of these definitions, but like I said, sometimes they can vary from institution to institution and field to field. So we just wanted to, again, never assume that we all um, know the same thing. So now that we've defined the terms, 
why are we doing this presentation? Why are workflows and documentation important for archives, libraries, and records management? And any institution really, but but in our instance, you know, we're focusing on those three. Um, proper documentation and efficient workflows are critical for any organization. Um, and like I said, this doesn't just apply to archives and libraries. Um, one thing, creating documentation provides transparency for an organization, which is really important. Um, they can help ease transitions for new employees or employees transferring to new roles. Um, the sooner an employee can learn how to do the work and the easier that transition is, the more efficient, efficient they can be in the workplace. It can save a lot of time for new employees. I know in my first few weeks in this job or any job I've had really, there's a lot of like learning and just browsing and trying to figure out, you know, where things are and, and sort of the processes of how um, to do certain tasks and just getting acquainted, but that's not always clear um, and documentation can help with that. Being a new employee is intimidating at times um, and there's so much you don't know, not that you're expected to, um, but being able to get clear information that you can continually reference until you learn more about your role and the organization is really helpful. Um, you know, I'm almost a year into my position since sometimes I still ask, you know, where is that? Where's, what's the process for this? Um, which is totally normal, um, but documenting these things can really ease the process for, for a new employee or an employee transferring into a different role within the same organization. Documentation can also be used to show growth and output for administration or upper management. Um, when we're asking for resources or evaluating our current workflows um, for efficiency, it helps to have something to point to, to say, according to our documentation, we create X amount of catalog records or we process this many collections. Um, and to do that, we have to actively and accurately document those things. Um, so for example, let's use digitization. So say during this fiscal year, you had two students scanning in addition to full-time staff, um, but last year you had four. If you're able to document how those two additional students benefited the work that you're doing, um, you may be able to use it to like make a case to get those positions back or to add more students to show, you know, our output was 67% more when we had those additional staff members assisting. Um, and, you know, even just simple statistics of um, the work output, you know, we completed X amount of finding aids this fiscal year. That's, you know, so many more than we did last year. So we're increasing, we're getting more efficient, we're getting faster. Um, or when we reallocated certain tasks, we were able to get more done in this area of work instead. So being able to clearly point to something like this can be really useful, like I said, especially with Ad, admin or upper management to say, okay, this is what we have, this is how we can improve, these are the numbers that show that. Um, so that, that's another way that it, they're really important and can be really helpful. Um, having processes documented and workflow established can cut down on duplicate work and it helps make quality control a lot easier. Um, as I'm sure we all know, things differ institution to institution and archivist to archivist, librarian to librarian, records manager to records manager. Um, but if you have a guide that says, this is how we do X, Y, Z, the hope is that you can create work products consistently based on the standards you have at one institution. And that saves time for, for new employees, but it also saves money in the long run. Um, by hopefully preventing duplicate work and making sure that you don't have to redo anything. And so quality control is a lot easier in that way. Um, additionally, it can give insight into why things are done cer a certain way. Um, we all know standards have changed. So, you know, sometimes working with um, legacy material can be a bit of a headache at times and that's totally normal. But how many times have you been like, Ugh, what was this person thinking? I just wish I could get into their brain you know, if only I knew what they did so I can sort of try to figure out what, what this problem is or how we can solve it. And while we can't go back in time and try to figure that out, um, if the process was documented now, future staff will hopefully not have those same issues. So that's really the goal to help make our jobs easier now and give future archivists more insight into the work that we're currently doing. Um, and when things do need to be updated, having a set process document 
set process documentation for that process and then a way to document the changes actually makes updates easier in the future. So if you have this, you know, clear guide and then something changes, you can easily go into the guide, make the change that needs to be made, document that that happened. And so, you know, in five years when someone is like, why did we start doing it this way? Well, it's written down on the guide. Why? Why? Um, you know, so th things like that can assist in the sort of legacy uh, collections or, or um, you know, older documentation that we have issues with now. The goal is to help make that a little bit easier in the future. And lastly, documentation and established workflows can help retain institutional knowledge. Um, you know, how many times have we heard someone say like, oh, that's located here, or you use this form, or you have to use this trick when you're running this program, um, but it's not anything that's written down anywhere. It's just something somebody knows, right? Um, and if those things aren't documented anywhere, that institutional knowledge is lost when someone leaves or retires, um, or even sometimes moves departments, whatever the reason is, they're not in that role anymore. Um, and when someone's worked for an organization for so long, a lot of it's muscle memory. Um, and that's really great <laughs> because it makes their work more efficient. However, when they leave, it creates problems. Um, and there are a lot of questions that really only that person can answer. Um, and so these are a few of the reasons why it's important to maintain um, proper documentation and efficient workflows. Um, I'm actually just going to bring these all up. Um, so how did the pandemic bring us to this topic? Um, when we first started brainstorming this idea, we realized we were all in uh, similar situations, just starting new jobs, either right before the pandemic hit or in the midst of the pandemic. And even though we all face different challenges based on our unique situations, we realized that because we were working remotely and socially distanced, um, that these established workflows and documentation would have really helped us in the onboarding process. Um, I think in most of my other positions, you know, I would shadow someone while they pulled boxes from the stacks or someone would sit um, next to me on the computer and show me how to do something, but we couldn't really do that in this environment. Um, as I'm sure any one of you who either started a new position or took on new staff at this time, um, or was even just teaching somebody something um, that they hadn't done before, right? It made it a lot more difficult. And so those traditional um, training methods weren't really possible. Um, everyone's going to share their own individual experiences, but we all realized that not being able to onboard as we had in the past definitely played a part in a longer adjustment period. And then once we started exploring these issues, we came to the conclusion that these problems were heightened because of the pandemic, but they were issues long before the pandemic hit. Um, new employees often face the same challenges coming into a new workplace and onboarding under normal circumstances can be difficult. Um, so even just taking the pandemic out of it, right? These issues were still issues to the onboarding process. Um, and our hope is that with these tools that supervisors and employees can hopefully work together to create improved documentation and workflows resulting in a more streamlined integration of new employees into the workplace. So I'm actually gonna be kicking off the discussion um, of our individual experiences. Um, as was mentioned in the introduction, my name is Catherine Slover and I am the digital archivist at, in Special Collections at the University of Texas at Arlington. Like my colleagues presenting with me today, I joined my current workplace this past year during the midst of the pandemic. pandemic. Um, I started in this position in August of 2020 and the previous digital archivist left in March 2020 just before everyone was sent to work from home. So no one was actually working in, in um, this position while they people were working from home. By the time I started in August, most of the special collection staff was working back in the office, um, but a lot of people in the library were still working from home. Um, and even though special collections was back in the office, we were obviously still social distancing and meeting remotely through Microsoft Teams. So again, that sort of increased any sort of like training issues because we couldn't like, you know, get together the way we would before. 
Um, as we mentioned, COVID brought certain onboarding challenges for all of us in different ways. Um, as a digital archivist, my role is much more of a technical role. Um, and in that way, training and onboarding was a little bit more difficult. Um, plus we were in the middle of the pandemic, so that didn't really help. Um, with this technical role, even under normal circumstances, it would have been difficult to rely on shadowing or other traditional training methods because although some people had some of that technical knowledge, it wasn't like I could rely on someone to sit there and show me to do every task because the only person who really knew how to do that all was the previous digital archivist. Um, so I really had to rely on existing documentation. So my predecessor left some documentation, which was really helpful, but there were a few issues I came across as someone trying to learn the ropes. Um, the documentation didn't really answer all of my questions, although it was very helpful. Um, some things just weren't written down. For example, um, my predecessor had some more technical skills than I do, and so some things that were obvious to them in the documentation were not obvious to me. Um, one example is my predecessor wrote this really awesome Python script to take our Word doc finding aids um, and encode them into XML, which is terrific, except for I have a much more basic knowledge of Python than they did. So I actually had to call my predecessor um, to get some clarification. And it wasn't that the documentation was bad, it was super helpful, but there were things that were just instinctual to them um, because they wrote it and they have more experience with Python. And so for me coming in as a new employee, um, I said it just wasn't instinctual to me when I read it, like everything that I was supposed to do. Um, and I think one of the most important lessons that I got from that is, is um, when you're writing documentation, write down everything and never assume anybody's knowledge level. Um, like I said, that's gonna come up a few times during this presentation. Um, but you know, my goal with documentation is that anyone in my department should be able to pick up the manual and follow it step by step. Now, of course, it's going to be questions and things, but the idea is that someone should be able to like pick it up and follow the instructions um, without too much, too much of an issue. Um, in addition to writing everything down, the other thing I did to add to existing documentation was add screenshots of things. Um, I'm a visual learner and so it helps me to see along with the instructions. Um, and what one thing that really taught me is when you're writing documentation, you aren't really writing it for yourself. Um, I mean, sometimes you are, like when you solve a problem and you're trying to remember how you solved it, obviously you wanna write that kind of stuff down. But in a lot of cases, this guide's meant for someone else in your department or the next person in your position. Um, you know, eventually we'll get to the place where we're the ones with institutional knowledge using muscle memory to do these tasks. So this documentation's really meant to serve the people we're training who are still learning the process. Um, so that was one instance where I took the existing documentation and workflow and added to it and enhanced it um, because really it was still up to date. It just needed, in my opinion, more explicit instructions. But in other cases, you're gonna be starting from scratch, which oftentimes can be more time intensive. And so you kind of have to weigh, is it worth it to just edit what's there? Or do you have to really start over and, and um, create a new process to make this work? Um, and one example of this is my work with Stephanie, who you'll hear from later on. She's the metadata librarian for special collections at UTA. Um, in the past, the same person who did cataloging for archival materials for special collections also encoding the, encoded the finding aids. Um, well, now Stephanie and I take on those responsibilities. And we also work with the archivists who are doing the accessioning, physical processing, and writing the finding aids in a Word template. Um, so there wasn't really a defined workflow who, of who did what at what point in time um, and when it came from the archivist to me to Stephanie in, in this larger workflow that we, we had. And so we worked together to create um, sort of a streamlined workflow that didn't disrupt anyone's regular work um, and allowed us to streamline the process and then document it in a tracking um, document. We used an Excel spreadsheet. Um, so that actually was the creation of workflow, but it also helped us track that work output, which was really nice. Um, in these two examples, you can see the different components of editing existing documentation and creating documentation and workflows from scratch. But I think they share some of the core 
lessons learned. Um, the first is communication is key. Communicating with others involved in the work in any capacity is critical. Um, I'm a big proponent of communication in the workplace, and I think especially with this kind of work, it's really important. Um, evaluating existing documentation and workflows to see what works and what doesn't is also very important. Sometimes you can work off of what already exists, and other times you do have to start from scratch. Um, all of us are gonna point this out today. Like I said, it's gonna come out up a lot, but write everything down. Um, even if you think that, no, they probably know that, write it down anyways. Um, and my last lesson learned is that you can't change everything in a day. Um, these are two examples of the work that I've done over the last couple months. And now we have a web archiving manual, a manual to encode the finding aids using the Python script, a document to, to track the creation of the finding aids, um, but there's still a lot more to do. And I, it's really important just to remember that, like I said, you can't change everything in a day and it takes a lot of time um, to implement this, this kind of work, but it is really important. Um, and with that being said, I'm now gonna pass it off to Stephanie Luke, who is the metadata librarian for special collections at the University of Texas at Arlington. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so I began this position in April of 2020. Um, that was, I think, a month and a half after um, the governor of Texas had issued a shelter in place order. Um, my primary responsibility is cataloging special and archival collections. And I was one of uh, a few employees that was working 100% on campus during the pandemic. Um, the nature of my work and handling the materials that we had uh, made working at home really impossible. Uh, the last in-house special collections cataloger was 10 plus years ago. Uh, we had, or they had a different department, Access and Discovery, uh, had taken charge of all cataloging, um, anything that was coming in and working on our backlog. Slide, please. So when I began at UTA, there was a lack of existing procedure in place. Uh, first, there was little applicable documentation on cataloging procedure. About five years ago, UTA libraries migrated from Voyager to Alma. So any existing documentation had not been revised following that migration. The very nature of metadata is also a cause uh, for the lack of documentation. So metadata standards and cataloging procedure are constantly being revised. Um, so, example, cataloging has um, moved from AACR2 to RDA. The field is also gearing up to begin an implementation of bid frame in the coming years. While A&D have maintained some documentation, uh, their procedures largely covered newer, more general materials whose records could be copy cataloged from existing records. And there was very little procedure in cataloging special formats like oral histories, antique maps, ephemera, and archival collections. Also, there was less procedure in place for original cataloging, which is what I largely do. Uh, when I began, it was also unclear why certain decisions were made. Uh, for example, the procedure for cataloging maps stated that the cataloger should include the specific year of publication in every subject heading field. Uh, to the right, you can see um, the old record here for a map um, from 1952. So this is not standard cataloging procedure, and it can actually impede the discovery of items since patrons usually do a more basic search of the catalog that doesn't include the specific year. Uh, finally, workflows between people and departments hadn't been adequately established. Um, a couple years before Catherine and I started, there was a reorganization of the library. Uh, so there's still kind of um, in transit um, some of the ways in which the departments worked. Um, so accessioning, cataloging, and digitizing were still in flux. The process had changed. Slide, please. Thank you. So what was implemented? When I began, the first thing I did was I facilitated a discussion with the stakeholders across different departments. So for access and discovery, I met with the department head and cataloging supervisor to determine all existing procedures and documentation. I reviewed these, looked them over, but I also identified areas that should be changed or could use improvement. 
And for special collections, I met with the head of special collections to determine the expectations of my position. I also met with the archivist in our department to gauge their knowledge of processing and cataloging procedures, uh, what metadata uh, experience they had, um, how they had been uh, cataloging archival collections, um, all that general knowledge. So finally, I met with um, the digital archivist, Catherine Slover, to discuss workflows for encoding finding aids and creating catalog records for process collections. Um, we're you know, working on documentation to um, ensure that everything is done consistently and correctly. Um, so the creation of documentations, I'm working on a cataloging procedures manual that includes all formats. Um, so everything from maps, ephemera, um, books, to archival collections, everything is, is slightly different. Also workflow documentations for materials that move within SPECO. So for example, from me to Catherine or me to an archivist or between departments. So um, if A&D sends something, um, we, we wanna make sure that we're being consistent. Also working with our digital creation department to um, digitize our materials is important. Slide please. So the lessons that I've learned since I've started this position is um, how important detailed documentation is. Uh, not only should it be um, you know, created, it should be updated annually to reflect changes both in the institution and in the profession. Um, so if a reorganization is happening, um, who is going to take over the, the curation of this documentation? Um, and also when the profession changes, for example, moving to bib frame in technical services, um, the existing documentation that we have in place should be changed to reflect this. I also learned that workflows are essential. So interdepartmental work needs clear process. Um, when Catherine and I started working together, um, we had the basic knowledge of, of how working between finding aids, her and I, um, should work but there wasn't really any uh, process written down. So we've been working together to create that. Also working with digital, curate, or digital creation, I'm sorry, um, to digitize maps. You know, what is, what is the process for that? What are the, um, the things that are priorities? Um, who accepts the maps or the archives or whatever and how they come back eventually to us? I also learned that there's a need for clear delineation of roles. So I have a position that works with you know, many departments and, and many in special collections do. So where does the authority to make decisions lie? Um, will it be you know, from higher up uh, the administrators or heads of these departments or can um, archivists or you know, digital archivists or someone like me make decisions about what should be digitized or what should be cataloged first or things like that. So next is Brenna Edwards. Uh, she's the manager for digital archives at the Harry Branson Center. Thanks, Stephanie. Okay. There we go. Okay. Um, whoop. Okay, my slides are out of order. So can you go to the next slide? And then the one after that, and then we'll go in reverse. Um, so, yes, I'm Brenna Edwards. Um, my pronouns are she, her. I am the manager for digital archives at the Harry Ransom Center at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, I started my position in July 2020, and I have actually been fully remote the entire time. I am actually speaking from Atlanta, Georgia at the moment. Um, so this position has been fully remote for me. Uh, the previous digital archivist left about a year before in August 2019. And uh, in the time between August 2019 and July 2020, whenever I started, the position actually moved departments from digital collection services to archival materials cataloging. So under the same division, but in different departments. And also in the interim, there was a graduate student uh, working with the Born Digital Material and had started that work with the previous digital archivist. Uh, so there were no workflow updates made and there was uh, very little official documentation, at least that I could see online. Um, 
of what the graduate student did except for the outcomes. So if we could go back two slides. Okay, forward one slide, sorry. Uh, <laughs> forget now. Okay, thank you. Um, so when I started, I had to do a bit of detective work. Um, I not only had to figure out where, like what my job was uh, remotely, but also figure out where all the documentation was, um, who to talk to in the both departments um, and seeing like what documentation would be useful to me from a distance. Um, so the current lab documentation was originally created in its current form in 2018 and was designed very specifically for lab things in person. <laughs> um, and other documentation such as reading room guidelines, um, description guidelines, uh, were all in different departments and scattered throughout the organizational box uh, account and also through different wikis. And of course, um, none of it was designed for remote work because nobody expects to be doing remote work um, for 14 months. Um, so some of the questions I asked while I was trying to search for these materials um, was what procedures have been put in place for requests made, like reading room requests for born digital material between March through July, or did we even need them because maybe they hadn't been requested at all? Um, if we needed them, what could I pull over from my previous job where I had created those procedures for the time being? Um, and also like, what, what could I do remotely and still be considered productive and successful? Um, just because again, nobody <laughs> expects to start a job fully remote when it's not intended to be. Um, so if we go back one slide, yeah, okay. <laughs> so what I ended up doing to sort of piece all the stuff together, um, I worked with both uh, the new, the archival materials cataloging and all the dis digital collection services departments to gain access to the wikis and to the box folders that I needed. It took a while to figure out who to ask for what and also who was in charge of granting access to certain things. So I ended up doing a lot of cold emailing and <laughs> introducing myself being like, hi, I'm the new person in this position. Can you help me do this? Um, which was very interesting to do over email as compared to like being introduced to these people. And like, like uh, Catherine said, like having somebody show you around and being like, this is what you do and this is where you go for this. So just sort of emailing me like, please help thread things together. <laughs> um, so what I've been doing uh, a lot as I come across documentation, I've been collating it into one box folder um, available to everyone within the department, but also easily to link to other people um, outside the department as needed. And you can see a screenshot of that to the right. Um, where I've also sort of broken it down into lab documentation, processing plans and inventories, projects, uh, reading room materials, deeds, and just like a general inventory. Um, I've also been working to link back to past digital archivist folders. So all the information is together and don't have to ask people hunting around going, hey, do you remember who had this position in like 2015? What was their name? What materials did they leave behind? Um, just trying to create links between everything um, and not tr having to rely on institutional memory uh, and just in cases. Um, slowly things are getting pieced together and what I've also been doing is making notes of changes made to workflows um, while remote, like remote reference requests, both internal and external, how are those being handled? and um, like restructuring our born digital storage system to make that uh, workflow go easier and just sort of noting down everything I'm doing. Um, I'm sure there will be lots more for me to like figure out whenever I eventually am there in person. It will be year one all over again, I'm expecting. 
Um, and so if we go forward, I think two slides now. Yeah, um, what I've learned is that advocating for myself and my position to make myself, to make my voice heard and also like, hey, I'm here um, is very important. Like I said, the cold emailing being like, hey, I'm here, please help me do what I want to do and I will help you. <laughs> um, documentation and making sure it's available even remotely is important. Again, I don't know what sorts of documentation that I've either had to piece together myself or that um, I have written might have already have components that are stored on a local computer from the past digital archivist or even printed out somewhere on site. Um, and I just don't know it yet. I'm sure I'll discover it when I'm there. Um, piecing things together like a puzzle can be fun, but it can also be time consuming. Um, if you're constantly on the hunt for documentation, it doesn't allow you to do other aspects of your job. And then again, documentation is important. Um, it can either be the key to everything or you can be left just having to do a lot of detective work. Okay. I'm going to pass it off to Kay Lewandowski for her to tell her tell you about her experiences as records manager at the Commander Naval Installations Command. Uh, thanks for that introduction. Uh, I'm Kay and because I work for the Navy, uh, the views expressed here are mine and mine alone and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Navy, the Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. Uh, for situational awareness, I started the day they sent everyone home, and like others have mentioned, uh, issues caused by a lack of documentation or a lack of workflows were issues pre-pandemic. CNIC has had at least eight records managers in the last 10 years. And the fact that we've had such a high turnover rate in my position was in no way connected to COVID or the pandemic. Next slide, please. So there was a lack of documentation, but there's also outdated documentation and working on site or working from home had little to no impact to the fact that 50% uh, of that legacy documentation either didn't exist or might have existed somewhere, but no one knew where. Um, and at some point I had just had to make that decision that this was a waste of time and money to look for this outdated uh, documentation. A lot of it was 10 years old. So, so many things had changed since then. It, it really was outdated and it really wasn't necessarily usable. I felt that it was a better use of my time just to start to create, document and develop that institutional knowledge um, myself. Next slide, please. And I realize this might seem random because the concept of end state is used in the military, but I find that it can apply to pretty much anything and I use it all the time. So what's the goal here? You know, what does it look like when you've completed your goal? Uh, and you can't really complete your objectives if you don't have a clear vision of what that other side of everything looks like. And my end state here is that K2.0 will be able to quickly pick up where I left off. You know, my end state is that K2.0 will be, will not have to recreate quote unquote stuff and will be able to build upon what I've created. And I hope there's little to no duplication of effort for my replacement. Next slide, please. Creating SOPs, fact sheets, trainings, workflows, et cetera, is a lot. There's also a lot out there and I'm a big advocate of copy and paste. Here's just some of the resources that I found helpful. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and when new employees are onboarding uh, with my command or they're checking out, I am the point of contact. And as you might've guessed, there was no, nothing in place. You know, I found this NARA checklist for employees leaving very helpful and I adapted it to my needs. And this just goes to show you that a lot of the documentation or workflows that you may or may not need is kind of already out there. You just need to adapt it to your needs. Uh, next slide, please. So CNIC is spread out globally, um, and it is important in any organization, but especially a large one, to have more than one person share and communicate information about records management, services, resources, issues, and compliance. You know, once I've created all this new documentation, all these workflows, I looked for role models, and I did a lot of, like was mentioned, those cold um, call emails of like, hi, I'm the records manager. 
would you like to be a part of um, this group? And you know, some people are really excited and some people not so much. So you just, you just never know when you're doing that cold call email, what that response uh, is gonna look like. So at the HQ level, so in DC, we have what we call records management liaisons, and those are just representatives from each department. At locations outside of DC, so outside of HQ, we have what we call regional records managers. And we meet every other month, and I provide uh, the training and guidance for both groups. And I started out small, and I just started to work with these folks and to build trust and understanding with these folks and then expanding it out to everyone else. Um, it really doesn't matter if I create the greatest workflows or the greatest documentation, if no one knows about them or if no one uses them. Having these folks aware of all the records management resources has helped to increase the use of them and has helped to build that institutional knowledge beyond me. Uh, additionally, K2.0 will have at least 50 people to reach out to once, uh, if and when she ever needs help. Uh, next slide, please. You know, what I've learned is that documentation is not only a records management department issue, but a command wide issue. And like others have mentioned, uh, it's an issue across various departments and organizations. And going back to that first rule of archives, don't assume anything, well, don't assume other departments have better documentation. CNIC started with a low hanging fruit. So in 2020, HQ did a big push to remove duplicate files from our share drive. Um, you have all these files, you have all these duplicates, you, even if you have um, workflows or documentation, it's difficult to know which one's the right one. So removing some duplicate files off of our shared drive, you know, helped to cut through some of the excess and helped us to have a better understanding and a newfound awareness of how we share our files, how we save our files, how we organize our files, and whether or not that has value and maybe we should do things differently. In building upon that, in the rest of 2021, we're working on an updating file plans, so inventories of our records, and we're looking at how our files, again, are organized, not just on our share drive, but also those really, really old legacy documentation and file cabinets and those pesky boxes in the basement that no one really knows what's inside and what do we do with them and so forth and so on. And the end state of all of this is not just um, better records management documentation, but can any employee, regardless of department, find what they need? You know, not only can K2.0 find what she needs, but can Bob 2.0 find what he needs? Next slide, please. Uh, official documentation is important. And however, email can also be a source of institutional knowledge. Because I work for the Navy, I can't really share my email. Uh, however, what I've done is I've created, I have a records management group uh, inbox. And what I've created in there is uh, folders that I can file away all my quote unquote work emails. So K2.0 will be able to find conversations I've had with our IT department or legal department, conversations I've had with Hawaii or Japan. And I would like to think that most of my documentation is quote unquote complete. However, this email access will address any questions about why I've made certain decisions. Uh, and now I'll turn it over to Brenna to further our discussion. Great. So we wanted to uh, end our session talking about the keys to successful documentation workflows, which you have heard throughout all of our presentations. So this is sort of a summary slide. Um, whenever we first got there, we all inventoried existing documentation and determined its status. Is it current or is it out of date? Um, also writing documentation for others and not yourself uh, with the uh, emphasis on write down everything. Assume no one even knows the basics. So uh, like if you have a script that you run, um, that you're like, oh yes, I use this every day. Not everybody does. And so writing down even like the most simple scripts saying, hey, you can use this for this task um, is very helpful. 
including screenshots and diagrams is necessary, accommodating for different learning styles, um, visual versus uh, reading. Um, also reviewing documentation on a regular basis and updating as needed, either updating uh, when a change is made, even if it's a temporary change, like everything going remote, um, or having a review date for every six months or year, just to make sure things are still going, or if you included something or changed something without even thinking about it. Um, keeping track of changes and updates, for example, using versions, um, such as like with Box or GitHub, or even just naming a file uh 2021 version one and just up every time you make an update note it or rename the file uh make documentation easily accessible and findable both for print and electronic copies um making it transparent to all staff uh collaborating with all staff divisions departments etc that are involved throughout the process both those that will use it and those that just need to know about it. Also have people review and test your documentation at different points and have them give feedback. If uh, most of us are so entrenched in our processes day to day that we don't even think about doing the small things that somebody who doesn't do a process every day could read your documentation and you skip from step A to step B without explaining A.1, A.2, et cetera. Um, so having people review and test it at different points and giving you feedback on how it could be improved or made more clear is invaluable, honestly. Um, it's really helpful. Uh, next slide, please. We also wanted to give um, some tools uh, for creating and maintaining documentation, some that all of us have used, some that part only some of us have used, and some that's like, I know about it and I've heard it's helpful. Um, these things include things like Box, which is great for organizing and versioning and sharing. Uh, you can comment and tag people if needed. GitHub, which is more open source if you want it open to everybody. And um, also great for versioning because you can see what every little change was made was. Trello, which is great for organizing and keeping track of this is how this workflow works um, and keeping notes of like, we need to write documentation for this. We need to figure out the workflow for this. Um, Airtable, similar to Trello and like an Excel spreadsheet, you can categorize things and spread and color code and all sorts of things, to create forms to get feedback. Um, that's more on the fancier side. There's also the Google Drive suite, um, including sheets and documents and slides and even Google drawing where you can create workflows. Um, there's also diagrams.net, which is great for making visual representations of workflows and actually has a integration into Google Drive if uh, you don't want to make another account. Um, there's also Canva, which if you want to make your documentation look really nice for like printing it out or you want to pull out the main parts of a documentation and be like these are the main points for here um, or even just creating the workflows in it there's also office 365 and microsoft office um, again sharing updating tagging people there um, even slack to talk about talk through how a workflow looks, how documentation looks, um, brainstorming, what might need to be documented, all of that. Uh, we also do want to note that uh, smaller institutions can do this work um, with you know, Word, Google, et cetera. It doesn't need to be some fancy program. Um, we just want to make sure everybody has documentation um, and yeah, so our next slide, I think we are ready for questions.
Okay, thanks everybody. That was an uh, excellent presentation. I know I learned a lot and could have used a lot of this 18 months ago. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Um, I'm not seeing any questions in the Q&A uh, so far, but uh, I have a few, few questions. Let me check the chat. I don't see anything in the chat either. Um, Let's see, here's one. Uh, could documentation discussions be an interview question from a candidate to an employer or vice versa? So I answered this. Um, I think it's a great question. Um, as someone who you know just went through the hiring process, uh, I think it would have been interesting to have gotten this question because um, UTA could have gauged sort of how I had experience with documentation and also the expectations um, that the institution had. So whether it's kind of following existing documentation, adding or updating it, and also creating new documentation, because I know Catherine and I here have done all of that. So I don't know if um, any of the rest of you have any answers. I'll jump in real quick. Yeah, I will say, um, I don't know if I was explicitly like asked like documentation and workflows, but but I think I if I'm remembering correctly, it's been almost a year, so I'm trying to trying to flash back. But I think I was asked something like about my experience with establishing procedure is maybe how it was phrased. So um, I of course you know relied on my experience. So I think it's a good question to ask, but I think it'd also be a good question for people who are interviewing to ask, you know, if they're, like, for my job, it's a digital archivist job, you know, what, what kind of stuff is set in place, or is anything in place, like, are those workflows established, because sometimes if it's a newer position, those things just might not exist, right, so figuring out maybe what's there um, could be a, a you know, an interesting question because um, I think I asked like well what's already you know put in place and I was told you know there is some documentation that they left and and there was and it was good to know that coming in so uh, I will also jump in um, I whenever I've been asked like what attracted you to this job my first response if it mentions documentation the job ad is documentation I love writing documentation I find it really fun piecing things together and making sure other people can follow it so I'm always the one who brings it up and that will sometimes lead to a later question about uh can you tell us more about your experience I haven't ever asked uh places during interviews about what documentation there is but yeah I think that would be a good thing to know especially like if the position is new like or even if there's been a significant gap. Okay, thank you. Uh, we just had another one come in. Uh, the question is, do you have any advice or thoughts on how to maintain focus on documenting workflows, especially as people return from remote work? Um, so I'll start this. Uh, so I always, and we mentioned this, you know, like, I always create everything for K 2.0, even my last job. Um, I'm always just trying to document for my replacement. Um, I'm very happy with my job. I'm not looking <laughs> for a new job. However, you always want to also be open to any you know, potential future opportunities. And that could be two weeks from now, or that could be you know, four years from now. And it's always hard that last 30 days to try to, you know, organize and get everything together so I just kind of do it as I'm as I'm doing it even just like that filing away that of those emails my predecessor at my previous job she accesses those because I'd set that up that way in that group email inbox and she accesses those emails probably once a month of like hey what was that conversation what did you discuss how did you agree upon this you know what was the back and forth just having that kind of, you know, low key access of information is uh, helpful and easy to do. 
Yeah, I want to, I, I mean, I want to jump in because I, I know how, right, maintaining focus on this is, you know, when you're writing it and you're in the midst of like, this is your project that you're working on. But outside of it, like when you, you know, you change a process and, and don't necessarily go back to like update the documentation. I know how easy that is to do because I've done it before. Um, so I think, you know, maintaining focus on it right outside of like, we're going to write a guide for this and that's a project that we're doing right and just making sure you're on top of it consistently um brenna mentioned this and, and i think steph needed to specifically um you know putting in those review dates um is really important and like making sure you have a set time like you know put it in your calendar you know set the same reminder every six months, every year, whatever, you know, put it in Outlook and you'll forget about it until it pops up. Um, I've done that with a couple of things and, and um, cause it is really easy. We have so much to do. And when you're like, oh, you know what? This isn't really working. I'm gonna change this little thing, but the little things add up over time. So I guess just putting in those, like setting up those reminders, um, making sure that other people on your team have those reminders too, so they can also stay on top of it. So, you know, if there if there's more than one of you, you're all trying to um, do the same thing. Um, one thing I did was at the end of one of my guides, I have like a, for small changes, like this file goes into this folder instead of this folder. I'm not gonna do a whole new version. That sounds, it was just like a lot of work. So I have like a little, um, chart that says like this date was or this thing was changed on this date by this person like i said it's something like the file location changes or something like that and so when we go to do the new version the hope is that you know we can just put those all in again but um that was just like a reminder for me when i make small changes so i can note it without again updating a whole manual and creating a new version so um but it's different for everybody but like i said those sort of annual or six month or however frequently you want to do it reminders, I think is really key to, to making sure that you come back to it, even if you're not on top of it, because stuff happens, right? Okay, I think we have a couple minutes left. Any other questions? I don't see any in the Q&A, but uh, if not, I had a at least one quick question. Um, so you had mentioned all these great tools there are for managing workflow like Slack and Trello. Um, did any of you find some of those tools more useful than others? Is there some you'd recommend over others? Or is it kind of personal preference or different ones for different things? Or I'm going to say personal preference. Um, and also just what you're comfortable with. Um, it, you don't want to try to figure out an entire new system while you're also like writing documentation at the same time. Uh, so personal comfort level and just personal preference, I think, and what you have time to learn if you're trying to learn something like GitHub or uh, whatever your institution supports too. If you're a Google campus or if you use Box or both or and just try and figure out what will be the most useful to people down the line. Yeah, and I, I just want to add one more thing to that. I totally agree with Brenna. And then thinking about also what's going to be the most useful to like your team now. Um, when you're thinking of like, I think of like tracking documentation specifically, right? Um, to me, Trello is pretty intuitive, but it's not to everybody. And so like we use, you know, Excel and we have an Excel sheet like that is in our Microsoft Teams and for our team that works really well, but there are other departments that use Trello because that works best for their team. So, you know, depending on, like, like Brenda said, what level of comfort people have, um, you know, not everyone's going to want to use GitHub. And so if, if you can't get that buy-in from people, it's not going to work as, as effectively. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks to all of our panelists for a great presentation. I 
person got a lot out of it and learned a lot. And uh, yeah, it's hard finding time to do the documentation, but you, you expressed uh, with everything, competing interests and everything going on, but uh, uh, definitely drove the point home how, how important uh, that is. So um, anyway, uh, we're about out of time. Uh, thank you all and thanks for everybody for attending. Um, I think somebody just put in the chat the link for the evaluation. So please uh, make sure to do those. And I don't have the schedule in front of me, but I think we have a little short break before the next session. Um, so thank you all again. Have a great, great day. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.